Uh, this is going to end on discussing HIV infection. And for almost everyone here, you're really very knowledgeable about HIV. Am I correct? Okay, so what I really tr tried to do with this particular lecture was try to integrate a lot of the immunological information that you've learned so far into the context of HIV infection. Some of it I've already alluded to in previous lectures, but this is kind of like to try to summarize it and integrate it in a way that you could really get an understanding of how HIV interfaces with the immune system. So questions to consider first is how does HIV use the efficiency of the immune system in order to efficiently infect and destroy the immune system? And it's actually rather brilliant because HIV has taken over a lot of the pathways that the immune system utilizes to be incredibly efficient to its own devices, namely to be able to rapidly disseminate its infection. What features of, the, of HIV replication specifically permit it to evade the immune system as well as becoming uh, resistant to antivirals? How is HIV replication regulated to synchronize its replication to those of the host cells? So as many of you know, a lot of cells are latently infected with HIV. It's most efficient for HIV to trigger replication when the cell itself is being activated and divided in order to generate the most a virus possible. How does HIV know what the activation state of the host cell is? And what me molecular mechanisms are used by HIV to evade innate antiviral cellular responses? In the past few years, very exciting discoveries have been made showing that our cells inside of them have what are called innate responses that enable us to protect our cells from uh, viruses, and how does HIV evade those actually re relatively effective uh, um, ways of doing that? Okay, so again, this you're all familiar with, uh, mode of HIV transmission, but what's obviously most striking is the difference between the United States and the world. The United States, about half of HIV transmission is a homosexual, uh, through, uh, through homosexual acts, uh, only about 10% are through heterosexual transmission. In contrast, in the rest of the world, between 80 and 85% is heterosexual transmission, and only a much larger, a, a much small fraction, 5 to 10% is through heterosexual transmission. Again, this is a, a, a cause of a lot of investigation why of this, this difference, but I'm not going to go into that right now. But what I, I actually thought was an interesting uh, figure that I picked up along the way is actually looking at the question of how infectious are different body fluids in terms of HIV transmission and also different cell populations. And I remember in the early stages of HIV infection when I was taking care of patients, all this was concerned was can you catch it from saliva, can you catch it from sweat. So for example, when Magic Johnson came out and said he was HIV infected and actually went back and played professional basketball. As you know, basketball players sweat a lot. And the question is, if you have a wound on your hand and you put your hand against someone who's sweating, is that potentially, can you get infected that way? And uh, the people said it probably it's not. And again, this information basically documents that. So whereas you could isolate virus very readily from plasma, you, you basically can't isolate HIV from sweat. Can't isolate it from feces. It's very hard to isolate it from urine and from saliva. So these are all basically indicating that there's less concern of transmission from these bodily fluids. And again, telling us again that casual contact is not how HIV is transmitted. And but what is actually very eye-opening is the difference between semen and vaginal cervical secretions. So where, whereas semen, you could basically isolate HIV from about at least a third of semen samples, and in fact, it has a reasonable amount of virus. In fact, vaginal secretions uh, have, even though you, it's detectable, it's at much lower levels, suggesting that semen is probably more infectious than uh, cervical vaginal secretions, which really uh, is on point in terms of male to female versus female to, to male transmission. Infected cells, again, obviously PBMCs have a high level of virus, but in addition, cells present in the semen also have uh, high levels of virus, again, indicating why that is such a, a, a location for transmission to, to come from. 
Okay, so now uh, talking about HIV infection, uh, how does HIV get past the mucosal barriers? Again, you're all primed and ready for this lecture because we just learned about the mucosal system. So now I show you the slide of the dendritic cell. These are epithelial cells, and you recognize that these are processes of the dendritic cells that are breaking through into the lumen of the intestine, and in fact, in, in, in a previous study, people had indicated that DC sign, a molecule expressed on the surface of dendritic cells, specifically bound GP120, it internalized it in, into early endosomes of de dendritic cells. And what's unique about these early endosomes is it doesn't have any digestive capacity. So even though HIV has been taken up by this endosome, it's not harmed. Its infectivity is not changed. So if we all, if you're all familiar with the biblical story of, jo of Jonah, how Jonah got swallowed by the whale, but clearly he didn't get into the whale's stomach and get digested. He was in a compartment that allowed him to basically be fully functional and active. And then subsequently, when uh, he came to the shores of Nineveh, he got basically spit out uh, to where he was supposed to go. HIV does the same thing with dendritic cells. It's got swallowed up in this early endosome, still maintains its infectivity, but now it's a hitchhiker inside the dendritic cell. And where is the dendritic cell headed for? The lymph node. It now gets into the lymph node, spits out the virus, and now the virus is exactly where it wants to be, in an environment wherein there are large numbers of T cells. Many of them are activated by this very dendritic cell, and therefore now it has targets that it could rapidly infect. Okay. So now, if we look upon that, so the early targets for HIV, dendritic cells, also CD4 positive T cells that are present, as you know now, in the lamina propria. But you also appreciate that, that, that intestinal, uh, the interstitial T cells are not going to be relatively resistant because they're CD8 positive. So it's only going to be lamina propria T cells. And now it gets drained to the lymph node and ultimately, ultimately to the spleen. And if you want to look at it on a, on a cross section, here's HIV, here's the mucosal barrier. It either gets across uh, through dendritic cells. It could also uh, get through M cells. So these are M cells. Virus could pass through the M cells. And now there are all these CD4 positive T cells waiting to uh, attack any pathogen that comes through. But instead, they themselves get infected with HIV, another mechanism by which HIV passes through the mucosal barrier. These cells get infected, and now those either dendritic cells, infected T cells, now drain into the local uh, afferent lymphatics, where they then go to mesenteric lymph nodes, where they can infect cells there. And in addition now, they drain ultimately through the lymphatics in, into, the, um, into the heart, where they can now get around in the circulation, as I'll show you again in a few minutes. Now, what's and this is a very dramatic picture uh, from a paper by Danny Dweck that I alluded to before. So you see basically two pictures of, of the intestine taken by uh, a colonoscope. Okay. Who here thinks that this is the normal appearance of intestine? Raise your hand. Just what the heck? You know, if you think so, just raise your hand. And who here thinks this is the normal appearance of intestine? Raise your hand. Okay, and I have to be very honest, you know, if I had seen this, I would have said this is clearly abnormal. I mean, look at it. All this yellow, disgusting stuff here, you know, that can't be normal. That can't be what my beautiful, clean intestine looks like. I mean, you know, I take good care of myself. Um, it, and this looks nice and clean and smooth. That's what you'd want it to look like, right? You know, it looks like, you know, you could have company and they, you'd be proud. It turns out... <laughs> that this is the normal appearance of the intestine. Why? What do you think these bumps and, and yellow uh, nodules are? Pyres, patches, lymphoid tissue, that's what it's supposed to look like. If you've, and this is an HIV negative individual. However, after HIV infection, these have disappeared. Why have these disappeared? Because HIV's wiped out the CD4 population in this gut. And if you do pathological examination, you could uh, immunocytochemistry, these are all CD4 positive cells all throughout the lamina propria. In the after HIV infection, it's completely wiped out. And this is showing, how, and this happens within, within weeks of the acute infection. So it's very rapidly disseminated, and it very rapidly attacks these cells. And you can appreciate tremendous amount of viruses being made by these T cells that are being infected and killed. And that's really the major source of the high level of viremia early on in infection.
And HIV has basically hijacked the process that the immune system uses to rapidly disse disseminate antigen-specific T cells throughout the mucosal system. I mentioned in the previous lecture that that's good. That way, all your mucosal lymphoid tissue throughout the body knows what antigens are out there. So for example, in, in a female, breast tissue has B cells that make IgA against whatever pathogens are in the gut. That way you can pass it on to the baby. However, HIV uses that to disseminate. So basically, it drains through the draining lymphatics into the thoracic duct. The thoracic duct drains into the heart. Now it gets into the, cir into the, into the, uh, into the circulation. And then now those infected cells disseminate all throughout the lymphatic uh, lymph nodes in the, in the mucosal system. And this happens incredibly quickly. In studies done in macaques, it's been shown that within a week of exposure, SIV is all throughout the lymphoid cells. Well, why is that important? The reason that's important is one would like to be able to take patients that have been exposed to HIV and treat them to block infection. So for example, let's say somebody is stuck with a needle that's infected with HIV. Well, clearly, you'd want to start them in a highly active antiretroviral therapy to prevent them from being infected. Somebody has a high risk exposure, they come to see you, they say, what should I do? You'd want to be able to block it. It turns out that because of this incredibly efficient rapid spread, the window for preventing HIV is probably, at most, one to two days. And that's why the recommendation is you have to take antiretrovirals within an hour or two after the initial exposure because of the fact it's so rapid in terms of its ability to get transmitted. If you kind of go home, you say, what should I do? I'm tired. I won't call a doctor. It's a disaster. You want to start it, and probably within, within two or three days, it's probably too late because this process has been so spread that you can't uh, block it. Okay, any questions? Okay, so basically now you have viremia probably fueled by, by the in vast infection occurring in the mucosal T cells, and then you have basically an immune response that generated, and I'll show you the time course in a, in, in, in a few slides, but ultimately you're going to make large amounts of anti-HIV antibodies, cytotoxic T cells, partially controlled replication. For years and years and years in the absence of therapy, there, there's a clinical late phase, but ultimately, you basically get depletion of enough CD4 T cells that you lose your capacity to fight infection and you develop acquired immunodeficiency syndrome. And if you now plot out CD4 T cells over time, what you see is, is that during the acute infection, patients have, as you know, a flu-like disease. I'll show you what the virus does in a minute, but you have a drop of the CD4 T cells, your immune, you have seroconversion, you start having an immune response, you tick up your CD4 cells a little bit, but nowhere near your baseline before infection, and then over the period of years, measured in, in terms of almost 10 years, you have slow depletion of CD4 T cells, it breaks less than 500, less than 200, once it's less than 200, you now basically have AIDS, in the sense that you're not able to fully protect yourself from other infectious agents, and it, that ends up being a terminal event eventually. And now if you look at the global picture of what's happening, if you focus on HIV RNA in the plasma, which is an indication of viral production, within the first few weeks of infection, you have this dramatic rise uh, of plasma viral load over a million copies per ml because you have unrestrained replication of HIV. First of all, there's a ton of cells in the gut that HIV can infect. Uh, secondly, there's no immune response to, to counterbalance that. However, ultimately, an immune response is generated, as I'll show you in a minute, and then the viral loads decrease, and then you have this long, chronic, low-level viremia, and then as your uh, immune system gets depleted, you're no longer able to control it, and the virus spikes up. If now you look in terms of CD4 and CD8, you have a spike of your CD8 cells that's, that's basically probably the reason for the, the control of the viremia, you keep these CD8 cells, they don't get depleted for most of the infection, which makes sense because they're not susceptible to HIV because they don't express CD4. However, your CD4 counts slowly inexorably decrease until, as I showed you before, you have the development of AIDS. In, in parallel with that, you also start losing your CD8 anti-HIV response. Why is that? What do CD8 cells need to be most functionally active? 
CD4 positive T cells. So as you lose the T cells, ultimately they're no longer as functionally capable as they were previously. Okay, you all now appreciate what is the most important tissue in the body vis-a-vis -vis where the immune system is generated? Lymph nodes, because that's where they, all the B cells and T cells go. That's where the antigen is brought. So if you would want to compromise someone's immune system, what tissue would you want to destroy? The lymph node. And that's exactly what HIV does. Initially, uh, again, lymphocytes are going to go through the lymph node. HIV is going to be introduced, a lot of CD4 positive T cells, that's a target for HIV infection. And in fact, as HIV is replicating inside the lymph node, it slowly destroys the infrastructure of the lymph node. So if you want to look at it pathologically, early on in infection, this is, this is staining for germinal centers. You have a lot of germinal centers packed with lymphocytes, a relatively normal looking architecture. However, as time goes on, the lymph node undergoes inv involution. You see you losing large amounts of T cells and other cells. So in addition to undermining the actual T cells themselves, by the time you get into the later stage, you've basically destroyed the infrastructure of the lymph node itself. So even B cells and CD8 cells themselves can't have the normal level of function that you have because you don't have that capacity of the lymph node to function as the organ where an antigen-specific responses can be generated. So there's another mechanism by which HIV compromises the immune system. Well, if we now look at what the virus itself does, and again, this is something all of you are familiar with, uh, is, you know, double-strand RNA, uh, HIV brings proteins with it, GP120, the capsule protein, GP41, uh, if one looks at the genome of HIV, what one notices, again, is that you, see all, you tend to see three different rows, and I'll discuss that in a second. Predominantly structural genes you all know, gag, pollen, envelope. There's several regulatory genes, and the ones that I'm going to talk about today briefly are TAT, REV, and VIF, and NEF, but particularly in their role in interfacing with the immune system. So, what do those three different rows mean when you see the, uh, the genome? What these three rows, this row is row one, this is row two, and this is row three, what it's referring to is the capacity of HIV to use an alternate reading frame. And normally, as you know, our chromosomes use a single reading frame. So you, you have an AUG start site and then triplet, 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 and you keep on going throughout uh, the gene. However, HIV only has a 10,000 base pair uh, genome. So it knows that if it would only use one reading frame, it can only pack so much genetic information. So what HIV does is very, very efficient. It uses other reading frames. And in so doing, it is able to basically get, you know, not exactly three times, but a, a lot a more information, more, more proteins made than just off of one reading frame. But you pay a price because it's impossible to generate three reading frames, all of which are exactly perfect in terms of being able to give you proteins. In order to do your alternate reading frames, you probably have to do a lot of splicing to get usable uh, genetic information. So your primary reading frames, GAG, Paul, and ON, are unspliced RNAs. However, the regulatory RNAs tend to be spliced. So for example, here you have a so, so a piece of TAT is transcribed here, a piece of TAT RNA is transcribed here, and then these two pieces are spliced together, a piece of REV, a piece of REV, and these are spliced together, and that will allows HIV, again, to uh, maximize the genetic information for protein production. One thing you hold in the back of the mind is the fact that REV and TAT are two critical early proteins required for HIV replication, and they are spliced, which has ramifications in terms of their transport from the nucleus. Okay, so again, all of you know the fact that HIV, GP120, binds to CD4 and a co-receptor, fusion occurs, and then the uh, capsid with the RNA enters the cell. Again, all of you are also familiar with the fact that if you look at it under higher magnification, the CD4 molecule juts out very, very high off the membrane. Why does it have to be so tall, CD4? What molecule does CD4 have to touch? MHC class 2. And in, in, in a normal situation, you would probably have TCR plus peptide over here, and in order to be taller than that, it has to be high. Right? Is that 
So, so now, GP120, before it even gets anywhere close to the membrane, binds to these tall CD4 molecules. But when CD4 binds to GP120, this binding causes a conformational change of the GP120 molecule. And two things happen. First, it now spreads lower down and opens up and reveals a face of the structure previously had been concealed inside, and this face is what is able to bind specifically to, to the chemokine receptor, either CCR5 or CXCR4. Wh why is that critical that this is hidden only and only revealed when GP120 binds CD4? Because the immune system can't see it. Normally, as we know, antibodies want to see three-dimensional structures. The three-dimensional structure is on the outside of the molecule. It's not on the inside of the molecule. By virtue of keeping this internal face that binds the chemokine receptor hidden, this protects it from antibodies seeing it and is another way by which HIV avoids the immune system and evades the immune response. And after this binds to the chemokine receptor, further conformational changes are triggered. GP41, which previously had been in this tightly coiled structure, like a, like a harpoon inside of a gun, basically releases the pressure, shoots GP140, GP41 with its hydrophobic end into the membrane, and this now allows the viral lip lipid bilayer to fuse with the cell membrane lipid bilayer and allow fusion to occur. And where does this lipid bilayer come from? It comes from the cell itself, and therefore that's why the fusion happens so smoothly. It's almost like a reunion of the lipid bilayers. As soon as they come in contact, they fuse. Now, HIV, yeah, question. Uh, uh, why antibodies that kill HIV? Excuse me? The antibodies. Why don't they kill HIV? Yeah. Okay. In other yeah, it, it's a, the question is why doesn't antibodies kill HIV? Well, first of all, uh, how effective are antibodies at killing viruses? They're, I mean, they're really not that effective because, you know, they, they're very good at killing bacteria, for example, because they recruit complement, they're able to stimulate opsonization, but to really kill a virus with an antibody is very difficult. I mean, there are reports, for example, that antibodies can sometimes rip apart uh, viral proteins and, and basically make them uh, uh, not functional, but the major mechanism by which viruses protect, which antibodies protect us from viral infections is by neutralizing the virus, which basically means it binds to regions in the virus that are required for the virus to get inside of a cell, and by binding to that, it blocks it. So now the question is, why doesn't HIV efficiently neutralize the virus by doing that? And I'll discuss that in a few minutes. So if, if you look at the, the different types of HIV isolates that are out there, there are at least two major types of strains of HIV that have been described. And these have been described based on what cells they specifically infect. And those two types initially were labeled entropic for being able to infect primary macrophages and T-tropic by virtue of the fact that they were able to infect T-cell lines. So M-tropic HIV isolates infect monocytes, primary T lymphocytes, and not T cell lines. And again, this is a common misconception because people, some people think, oh, M-tropic, macrophage tropic, means it can't infect peripheral T cells. That's not true. M-tropic isolates very well infect primary T cells. They just do not infect T cell lines, like H9. That's how it was first described. In contrast, and uh, M-tropic isolates are really critical because they are the ones that initiate HIV infection. And the observation was made that if you have a patient that has a mixture of M-tropic and T-tropic isolates in their bloodstream, now they go and infect a new individual. If you look in the blood of the new individual, it's all M almost all M-tropic isolates. So it seems for some reason that still hasn't been definitively demonstrated Antropic isolates are preferentially transmitted mucosally, and it's almost like you're resetting the infection clock. Because as time goes on, T tropic isolates, which can infect T cell lines, primary T lymphocytes, and not monocytes, as the individual starts heading towards AIDS, 
T-tropic isolates become the predominant isolates. So early on, M-tropic isolates are what transmits the virus. T-tropic isolates become the predominant isolate. Why is that important if you would be designing a vaccine? So now if you're designing an HIV vaccine to prevent transmission, what type of virus would you want to protect someone from? Amtropic isolate. And in fact, that sounds very obvious, but it turns out that early on in the history of HIV, the early vaccines were generated against T-tropic isolates. Well, why is that? Because T-tropic isolates were very easy to grow up because they grew up in T-cell lines. So you could grow buckets and buckets of virus, clone them out, sequence them, and make enough to make a vaccine. M-tropic isolates were a lot harder to grow because you required primary T-cells to grow. They're a lot harder to get. You have to get them from patients, and they don't expand as well. And that was, But obviously, looking back, that probably wasn't the way to go. Those aren't going to be most effective. You want to target M-tropic isolates. Well, what is the mechanistic basis, and again, all of you are familiar with this, of why some strains are T-tropic and why some are M-tropic, it turns out it depends upon the chemokine receptor utilized. So R5, CCR5, is preferentially used by macrophage, macrophage tropic strains, and CXCR4 is preferentially utilized by, by uh, T-tropic isolates. And again, th this is a reasonably good explanation. Uh, there's only one minor problem with that. Initially, people would say, well, the reason that X4 isolates cannot infect macrophages is because macrophages don't express CXCR4. That's logical and makes a lot of sense. However, when you actually look at macrophages, they do express CXCR4. So it's a little bit more complicated. There probably are subsequent blocks in macrophages that somehow prevent infection with CXCR4 uh, or T-tropic isolates. But be that as it may, M-tropic isolates, CCR5, and T-tropic isolates, CXCR4, and this was very gratifying because it explained the basis for why some strains are M-tropic and some strains are T-tropic. There also are dual tropic isolates called uh, R5X4 isolates that can apparently infect macrophages, peripheral T-cells, and T-cell lines re relatively easily well, and it's unclear exactly what the pathogenic uh, uh, implications of that are. Okay, any questions? Well, how can we definitively say that M-tropic isolates are the critical isolates for transmission of HIV infection? How can we say that definitively? You can do an experiment with try to infect with only T with M. Who are you going to only infect? No, in a, in a mouse or something. Well, not a mouse, okay, not right. Now, mice are not infectable with HIV yeah. because their CD4 and CCR5 and CX don't bind GP120. So again, a lot of you are involved in cohort studies, in patient studies. So let's look at a large group of cohorts who are at high risk for HIV infection and ask the question, are there people who are exposed to HIV that don't get infected? Right? Oh. So this is just to show you again uh, the chemokines that SDF1 is the normal ligand for CXCR4, CCR, and MIP1 alpha, MIP1 beta, and RANTIs are the normal ligands for CCR5. But now, if you look at a cohort of patients, there was a small number of patients that had partners that were HIV infected, and despite multiple, multiple exposures and not taking the appropriate precautions, these individuals did not get infected with HIV. And once this discovery of the chemokine usage of HIV was d discovered, then the researchers went to these patients and said, what about their CCR5 and CXCR4? Is there something special about them? And it turned out that there are individuals who have ho homozygous for a de defect in CCR5 expression. They have a early stop codon and CR5. They don't express CR CCR5. So uh, maybe about between 15 and 20% of the population are heterozygous for this defect. If you're heterozygous, you're still expressing lower levels of CCR5, so you're not absolutely resistant. But of those, uh, less than 5% are homozygous don't express CCR5, and therefore these individuals 
were not, were relative, were very resistant to being infected. There are a handful of patients that have been infected, but overwhelmingly they're protected. So what is this teaching us? that M-tropic isolates, CCR5, are critical for transmission because they were exposed to CXCR4 positive isolates as well, and that didn't seem to be efficiently transmitted. So this is a very, very important observation in terms of teaching us the critical role of CCR5 in transmission. And again, this is very important therapeutically because now we have CCR5 inhibitors that are now licensed to use as a new therapy for HIV. Okay, so now HIV comes uh, as a double-stranded RNA, and it has to get translated into cDNA in order to ultimately integrate into the host chromosome. This process occurs through the enzyme reverse transcriptase that HIV brings with it. Well, there's one good news and bad news, the, which, which actually is that the bad news is that reverse transcriptase is well, actually, the good news is that reverse transcriptase makes a lot of mistakes. Well, you think that's good for us because that means that the genome of HIV is going to continuously maybe have mistakes made and not be effective in terms of generating future variants. However, it turns out, that's actually the bad news because instead of having a stable genome that allows our immune system to target a epitope that will stay the same, or drugs to target a protein or enzyme that stays the same, it's continuously mutating. And this has resulted in HIV being able to continuously generate variants that may turn out to be resistant both to the immune system, as I'll show in a few minutes, as well as to drugs. So the use of re this error-prone reverse transcriptase has major implications in terms of HIV's capacity to rapidly evolve and evade both the immune system as well as drug therapeutics. So in terms of where, does, where is HIV made? What is the primary source of HIV in tissues? And it turns out that HIV can replicate and activate CD4 positive T cells in macrophages as well as slow levels in resting memory CD4 positive T cells. The primary location for HIV replication is activated T cells. A lower amount comes from macrophages, and an extremely low amount, infinitesimal, comes from resting of memory T cells, and I'll come, come back to this population in a few minutes. But now let's focus on the large amount of HIV being produced by CD4 positive T cells. What happens is, is that every round of infection you introduce mutations. How much HIV do you make in a day? This is a, from a study that David Ho did demonstrating that you make a billion particles of HIV every day. That sounds like a lot, which, and it is. But let's put it into context on what that means. The lifespan of HIV, a free virion, eight hours, an infected cell, two days. That means that the virus can go through 300 replica replication cycles in a year. Because RT does not proofread and it's error prone, it basically introduces an average of one mutation every 10 to the fourth basis. What is the size of the HIV genome? 10 to the fourth basis. Which means that if you make 10,000 virions, you've basically mutated every nucleotide at least once in the entire genome. It's mind boggling. Imagine how long that would take for you to do in a laboratory using appropriate reagents. But you don't make 10,000 viruses in a day, you make a billion viruses in a day, which that means that you basically mutate every position of HIV over 10,000 times every day, and you have 300 replication cycles a year. HIV is a mutation machine. It's continuously changing. And you have to appreciate the fact that this is an average of one mutation per 10 to the fourth basis. Some cycles, you may get two, three, four mutations, which is what allows HIV to be, develop resistance to multiple drugs. So this generates resistant mutants that will selectively become the predominant population. And in fact, if you now take patients that have uh, a stable level of, of virus in their bloodstream, you put them on a single drug that's anti-HIV. Well, it works. Basically, the level of the virus drops dramatically. But that only works for a certain period of time. Within a, a matter of a week or two, the level of virus goes back up to where it was before. Why is that? 
same drug, same patient, why does that happen? Well, now you sequence the virus and you discover at time zero there were no mutants against this drug. However, by four weeks later, 100% of the virus now has the mutation associated with resistance to this drug. What happened is, at this time point, you basically had a very, 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 very small level of mutants, mutants resistant to this drug. Didn't replicate as well, so it was an extremely small subpopulation. You had a new selection pressure, the drug, now the variants that have been replicating very well but were susceptible disappear. What becomes the dominant isolate now is the, is the mutant that now is resistant to drug. But it's not just for drugs this happens. Let's imagine, and this is the question that you asked, you've made a great neutralizing antibody. It basically blocks HIV from getting to bind to CD4 fantastically. What's going to happen? Boom, the level of virus goes down because you've been successful. But now what's going to happen is that HIV mutates that epitope so you have this great antibody, but the epitope it recognizes is gone. Now what's going to happen to HIV replication goes right back up again. So you make a new antibody, recognizes a new epitope, blocks HIV replication, level of the virus goes down. What's going to happen? New variant, new mutant, doesn't have that epitope, comes right back up. This is going on over and over and over again during the course of HIV infection. And in fact, that is the major problem with HIV, that most of the epitopes that antibodies seem to recognize are ones that are really dispensable in terms of function of GP120. That's why it can mutate away and the virus is still infectious. The holy grail of at least humoral immunity and vaccine development is identifying those epitopes that antibodies can bind to that HIV can't mutate, because if it mutates those, those epitopes, it'll no longer be infectious. And I'll discuss in a few minutes those particular epitopes. Okay, does that answer your question? So our you know, immune system is doing a pretty good job, don't knock it, but the problem is HIV, because of its mutation, is able to avoid it. So now, if you look in terms of the immune response, it controls infection but doesn't eradicate it. It probably, cytotoxic T cells play a critical role during the initial resolution of the high level of viremia because antibodies aren't made until a little bit later, but subsequently both CTLs and antibodies play a critical role in keeping the level of the virus down. As the CD4 counts go down, CTLs are compromised. You basically now have mutated GP120 so many times that it finally has a pattern of epitopes that you can't make antibodies against, so you can't be controlled anymore with antibodies and now the viremia goes way up. Now, CTL response is critical for controlling viral infections, as you well know. Cytotoxic T cell is seeing a peptide derived from HIV in the context of class one MHC molecules. And again, I don't have to go through this because you, we just learned this, class one, class two. And again, class one is presenting endogenous virus, endogenous peptides derived from, in this case, viral infections presented on class 1 MHC on the surface. Now, if one looks at the structure of the peptide, as you recall, it has two faces. One face points down towards the MHC molecule, and what do we call these residues that are pointing down into the MHC molecule? Anchor residues. It's even helpfully written over here for you to see. Right? So anchor residues. And then we have epitopes that are pointing up towards the T cell that is seeing it. Well, it turns out, as I'll show you in a minute, that not only can HIV avoid the immune system by mutating the epitopes that the T cell sees, so the same way it mutates the epitopes that antibodies see, it also could avoid the immune system by mutating these anchor residues. Because imagine if the peptide lacks the anchor residue. Is this peptide now going to be presented in class 1 MHC? No. So therefore, even though you have fantastic cytotoxic T cells, you can do tetramonalysis, you have loads and loads of the cytotoxic T cells, they're looking for that peptide to be expressed on the surface of the HIV infected cell, and they don't see it anymore. And that's, again, because HIV can mutate, it can generate these variants. And in fact, there are possible strategies used by HIV to evade CTL response. 
generation, as I said, of immune epitope escape mutants, as I'll show you in a minute, also down-regulate class 1 MHC expression, and also you can decrease the qualitative activity of HIV-specific cytotoxic T-cells. Chronic antigen exposure will decrease cytotoxic T-cell activity, decrease perforin production, telomere length, and increase their susceptibility to apoptotic death. And as we mentioned before, you need CD4-positive T-cells in order to rev up CD8 function. If you lose CD4 positive T cells, not only will you diminish CD8 activity, you're also going to diminish B cell activity and the ability to make new neutralizing antibodies to mutants that have been generated. And this is just to kind of refresh your memory. This is showing peptides with anchor residues. And this is a paper that uh, I believe uh, Bruce uh, uh, co-authored demonstrating that th this group of children where they basically lost the ability to recognize uh, HIV by virtue of a mutant that occurred that turned out to be the anchor residue. And this was just demonstrating the fact that if you now took the wild-type peptide, you could basically demonstrate that that peptide gets presented. However, if you now take the mutant peptide, and this, this is one mutated at this residue and this residue with the blue triangle, even though you add the appropriate, this, this, this peptide now will no longer bind to A2, and now, in this case, if you look for the ability to control infection, the wild-type virus, you're able to, you basically, you're basically able to, so the, the, the mutant, in, let's see, hold a second, the mutant virus here, you can't control infection, and P24 levels go up, whereas the wild-type virus, you're basically able to control with cytotoxic T cells that are added quite well. Again, demonstrating that loss of those residues prevents expression of this viral peptide by A2, uh, A2 and that's how HIV can avoid a cytotoxic T cell response. Okay, if you recall, I mentioned in a previous lecture, NEF, and one of the activities that HIV-NEF has is it can downregulate the expression of surface molecules. Well, one molecule it downregulates is CD4. Well, that's important because that prevents the cell from being super infected with another HIV virus. However, it also downregulates expression of class 1 MHC. So now what happens is that and this is again from another paper by Bruce showing that if you infect with a NEF negative mutant, and now you stain for expression of HLA2, and this plop is, is basically a marker that's in the virus, you could show that you have a population of HIV-infected cells, but they express HLA2 to the same degree as the uninfected cells. Right? Is that clear? However, now, if you take wild-type virus that has NEF expressed, what you see is the uninfected cells express the same level of HLA2 here, but now the virally infected cells dramatically lower their expression of class 1 MHC. So now NEF is down-regulating MHC class 1 expression. If NEF down-regulates class 1 MHC expression, what happens to the ability of cytotoxic T cells to kill these infected cells? Compromised. It's compromised. And in fact, here you see that if you add cytotoxic T cells, the ones that lack NEF, they're nicely inhibited, the ones that have functional NEF, they basically are not killed by the CTLs because the CTLs can't see peptide in MHC class 1 for them to target and kill the cells. Okay? Is that clear? Any questions? And this is the uh, paper by, by, by Bruce with David Baltimore describing how NEF downregulates class 1 MHC and protects from killing cytotoxic T cells. Okay, another molecule, like earlier today, we discussed CTLA-4 as an inhibitory molecule that down-regulates <coughs> T-cell function. There's another molecule that's been described that, that similarly inhibits T-cell function after a while to turn it off, and it's called PD-1. And basically, what this is showing is that a naive T-cell, MHC plus peptide, TCR, co-stimulatory signal, CD28, cytokines are being made. This naive T-cell now becomes an, activ an activated effector cell. In this case, we can call it a uh, cytotoxic T-cell, CD8 positive. And if everything is okay, you clear the infection, and now you become a memory T-cell. An important concept to think about 
is that the immune system is designed to fight short, focused wars. Because the classic infection, think about it. You get infected. You're sick for a couple of days, maybe a week. But then your immune system kicks in. You eliminate the infectious agent, and you get all better. That's what, H that's what our immune system is designed to do. Our immune system is not designed to fight a chronic war. Why do you think our immune system isn't designed to fight a chronic war? Because what's the most common antigen we're going to see day in and day out? Self-antigen. So there's an inbuilt fear that if we're responding immunologically to something for a long period of time, maybe it's self. So therefore, we should turn off that immune response. So whenever an immune response goes for too long, we have this kind of built-in process wherein we downregulate our immune response. Well, what happens if we can't clear the infection? Then what we do is we basically call off our immune system too early before we've eradicated the infection. And now we have a, a chronic infection. But what is one mechanism by which we turn off the immune system during chronic infection is by expressing this molecule called PD-1 when it interacts with PD ligand expressed by an antigen presenting cell, macrophage or dendritic cell, it sends a signal to this T cell, which is called exhausted T cell, saying no longer be fully armed with all of the appropriate cytotoxic molecules that you need to be effective. Now it's time for you basically to hang up your uh, perforin and basically go home. However, there's still infection going on, and that's why you can't clear the infection. So in fact, this observation has led to the postulate that maybe if we blockaded PD-1, pd one interaction with either antibodies against PDL or antibodies against PD-1, maybe now we could turn off this negative signal and resurrect and reinvigorate these T cells to now allow them to get back to killing HIV-infected cells. And currently, there are clinical trials that are being initiated looking at the ability of this, inter of this intervention to reinvigorate the CTL immune response against HIV. Okay, any questions? So this is just uh, one slide to show you a, a, a project that we're doing in our lab. And we're utilizing uh, molecular engineering actually to make designer cytotoxic T cells. Because now, as you very well know, what gives T cells specificity in terms of what antigen they recognize? What molecule that they express? T cell receptor. So if you have a T cell that's expressing one receptor, and you now give it a different receptor, what are you going to do to its specificity? You're going to change it. So can we do this for HIV? So the approach that we're doing, and we're collaborating with Bruce's group doing this, we take HIV-specific CTL clones, we clone out the TCR alpha and beta chain, we put it into a lentiviral vector, and now what this allows us to do is generate lentivirus, and now we can take this lentivirus, we could transduce peripheral CD8 T cells that have any specificity, but now once this has been transduced with this vector, it now has the genes for the alpha and beta chain from this HIV-specific CTL clone, and now we could transform this peripheral CD8 T lymphocyte into a genetically engineered HIV-specific CTL. And what's really cool about this approach is, first of all, we could basically take TCR, alpha, and beta from any CTL clone. We could identify very potent, high-affinity TCRs that are very good at killing HIV-infected cells. And in addition, we could also engineer into this vector, which is what we're doing, other genes that could dramatically increase the capacity of CTLs to be functional. So we could put shRNAs that downregulate PD-1. We could put granzyme B to make it a more effective killer. So that this allows us potentially to make even better CTLs. And the kind of vision is that we could harvest peripheral CD8 cells from a patient that, and since they have not yet proliferated because the antigen they recognize is not one they've seen, they're fresh, almost naive T cells. They're not exhausted. They're more than happy to go into battle. We reprogram them ex vivo, then potentially give them back to the patient, and then now the patient has reinforcements to allow it to, to reinvigorate its immune response against HIV. Christian? Won't HIV just, how long does it take to grow these T lymphocytes outside the body and then put them back in? Because won't HIV just outmutate your designer? Yeah, it's, it's an excellent point. Well, 
how is that going to get around the uh, mutation problem? The answer is, is that one of the reasons why HIV is so successful in doing that is that another philosophy of the immune system is it tends to generate a very narrowly targeted immune response against only a few epitopes in any given pathogen. You don't make cytotoxic T cells that recognize 100 epitopes. You tend to make cytotoxic T cells that recognize what we call immunodominant epitopes. So the it's a, and what, well, what we would, would hypothesize to do would be to generate a mixture of lentiviral vectors, each of which recognizes a, 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 that, that encodes a TCR recognizing a different epitope. And what then we would do would be to to uh, transduce these peripheral CD8s with a mixture of lentiviruses and therefore give the patient a broad array of TCRs recognizing a broad array of epitopes. So you may mutate against one, but not against another. So in, in, conceptually, we would call that immunological heart, highly active antiretroviral therapy. Be, in the same way three drugs were great, one drug doesn't work well at all because of mutation, we would postulate multi-epitope therapy would work really well, whereas a narrowly targeted one, which is naturally generated, doesn't work very well. Okay. Now, you talked about antibodies. Neutralizing antibodies can prevent viral infection. As you know, that the, the uh, antibody binds to the virus, in this case would prevent GP120, from binding to uh, CD4 or CCR5. Well, antibodies can have different effects in HIV infection. They, the good news is they could be neutralizing, or they could interfere, or they could uh, uh, interfere well, with binding of the virus. However, there are negatives that antibodies can do, and these have been reported. And again, it's unclear how clinically relevant they are, but they clearly have been reported in in vitro studies. But some antibodies may actually enhance HIV infection. And one hypothesized mechanism is if the antibody binds HIV, now the antibody binds to the FC receptor, that may provide HIV with another way of getting inside of a cell. Because as you remember, FC receptor antibody complexes get internalized. That may be a way that HIV can get inside of a cell independent of CD4, CCR5 interaction. In addition, uh, HIV may also stimulate autoimmunity because some of the antigens present in HIV may resemble those of cells. And again, some HIV patients, as you well know, have autoimmune diseases. So antibodies may be both good and may be bad. Well, I, you previously had said that one of the problems with antibodies is they tend to recognize narrow epitopes that really are specific for the strain that is infecting the individual, and those can be mutated. The holy grail is identifying epitopes that are critical for HIV that it can't mutate against, and therefore that's why one would want to identify broadly neutralizing antibodies that can neutralize a very wide range of HIV strains. Typically, if I would take neutralizing antibodies from one patient and try them against the virus from a different patient, it wouldn't work very well because it's only strain specific. But a, so, a very rare number of broadly neutralizing antibodies have been identified, and they tend not to come from patient serum, but they tend actually to come from B cells that have been immortalized or uh, formed hybridomas, and one region 2F5 and 4E10, these are the names of the monoclonal antibodies, is present at the stalk of, the, of GP41. Another, and, and here you have uh, 4E10, and there's another uh, other monoclonals identified, 2G12, which recognizes a uh, carbohydrate antigen, and B12, which recognizes the face of CD4, uh, that GP20 interacts with CD4. These are rare, uh, broadly neutralizing antibodies, and there was a tremendous amount of hope that maybe these may be the holy grail antibodies that we could utilize to prevent uh, HIV in infection. So now what you'd want to do would be, let's make a vaccine, and this vaccine would stimulate these antibodies. Well, one po po problem that arose is that it's been reported that these epitopes, 2F5 and 4E10, actually have similarities towards self proteins, in this case, cardiolipin. So therefore, you make a vaccine, you immunize the patient, but then they're not going to make antibodies because it looks at the vaccine and says, that's self. I'm not going to make antibodies against self. And that may also explain why patients themselves don't make high levels of these antibodies because it's considered a self-epitope. 
Again, there are, I have to, there are papers suggesting that may not necessarily be completely true, but at least it's, it, this is a, a possible explanation of why you can make some antibodies that could be highly neutralizing. The 2G12 is a carbohydrate antigen. Those are notoriously difficult to make uh, antibodies against in a vaccine uh, system. Again, people are currently working on that. But what I would think is something that I find a little bit depressing in this process is this experiment where they basically ask the question, let's make these antibodies and let's treat patients with these antibodies and let's see what happens. And in this experiment, they basically took patients who had been on antiretroviral therapy. They were able to suppress the level of, of the antibody down to undetectable levels. Now, the ART was stopped, and then they looked at the level of, vir of virus that came up. And in fact, even though they were on 4, 2F5, 4E10, and 2G12, a cocktail, nevertheless, they still saw that ultimately the virus came back, and in fact, that virus turned out to be resistant to these previously broadly neutralizing antibodies. So that was uh, a little um, disconcerting because it suggested that even these epitopes can be mutated and nevertheless the virus is still able to replicate. So that's again what needs to be identified is an epitope that's highly conserved that HIV can mutate because then it makes HIV non-functional. Yeah, uh, these, different call, these different calls represent different patients. And I apologize because for some reason the source of the paper got deleted during uh, the making the slide. Uh, usually, like, you obviously want to give credit where credit is due for the study. Okay, this, this now let's talk about memory T cells. Well, what's the hallmark of memory T cells in terms of lifespan? They're long lived for decades. So if, you would want, if you're a virus and you would want to hide inside of a cell for a long period of time, what cell would you pick? A memory T cell. And in fact, the fact that HIV can infect resting T cells and live in them has really uh, made a major problem in terms of eradicating HIV infection. Because you could take patients, treat them for years and years and years with high dose ret uh, antiretroviral therapy, not see any detectable virus, take them off of antiretroviral therapy, and boom, the virus comes back within a few a weeks to months because it comes out of these resting memory T cells and then gets reintroduced into the lymphoid system. So this capacity of HIV to, to live and infect resting memory T cells, which some of which can live for decades, has really made it almost uh, impossible at this stage to eradicate HIV infection just by giving antiretroviral therapy. What you're going to need to do is come up with a way of identifying what resting memory T cells are infected with HIV and eliminating those cells. And as of yet, we have not developed the technique and technology to do that. OK, but now you have a resting T cell. It's not actively replicating, not actively making HIV. How does the cell know to turn on when the cell is undergoing replication? Well, again. Keep on asking me for T cell signal transduction slides, so I keep on providing them. But what I want to focus on is look at these transcription factors. You know them well. NFAT, NF-kappa-B, AP1. These are made when the T cell is activated and turned on. Now, this is a, a piece of the long terminal repeat of HIV. If now you look at the sequence in this regulatory region of the LTR, the long terminal repeat, you see that there are motifs that bind AP1, NFAT, NF-kappa-B, SP1, which are all cellular transcription factors. So what happens is the cell gets activated. It makes its cellular transcription factors to turn on cellular genes. But at the same time, those transcription factors are binding to sites in the HIV long terminal repeat and activating HIV. So at the same time the cell's being activated, this latently infected virus is also being activated, and now it spews out tons of virus that can then go on to reintroduce the infection. So again, this is how, again, HIV hijacks our normal regulatory system and the immune system for its own benefits. Okay, so HIV utilizes two proteins, TAT and REV, that are critical for HIV function. Well, TAT is critical because TAT is 
important in terms of permitting elongation of the RNA transcript. In the absence of TAD, you get very, very low levels of virus being produced. But what is the role of, of REV? And REV basically plays a critical role that's dependent upon the fact that it is spliced and structural RNA is not spliced. If you look at this genomic RNA piece, you have a sequence called RRE, which is rev responsive element. And now, if we look at what happens during transcription, you have integrated viral DNA. This is the me nuclear membrane, and this is the nucleus, and this is the cytosol. You have integrated viral DNA, you have unspliced RNAs, and you have spliced RNAs. Normally, during uh, replication, this sequence, and this sequence is called CRS, or cis-restrictive site, this prevents these RNAs from leaving the nucleus, and therefore they ultimately undergo de degradation. So these are the structural RNAs making gag pollen M. However, REV, which is a spliced RNA, has this restrictive sequence spliced out, and now it could leave the nucleus in order to make its in order to make the REV protein. But now what happens is REV protein is made, REV protein gets back into the nucleus, binds to this site, which is called the cis-acting region or the REV responsible element, and now this gives the, R, the structural RNA a pass, allows it to leave the nucleus, and now make the structural proteins. So this is the mechanism by which REV works, and Again, uh, you basically have the cis, restri the, 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 the cis restrictive sequence keeps the structural RNAs inside, they get degradated until REV gets made. REV is made because it's, it's a spliced RNA, so it loses those restrictive uh, RNA sequences. REV comes back in, binds to the cis, reactive, cis acting region or REV restrictive element. Now it gives it a pass. Now these can leave. And again, Teleologically, why does this happen? Probably because what this allows you to do is build up a large amount of structural RNA inside the nucleus, REV goes in, and then in a very short period of time, you can get a large amount of RNA leave the nucleus, go into the ribosomes, and make a large amount of HIV proteins in a very, very short period of time. This basically, it's kind of like when you do cell culture and you have proliferation, you want to kind of align the replication of the cells exactly to the right uh, time frame, and that seems to be what uh, HIV is doing with the REV uh, protein. Okay, um, VIF. VIF uh, is another viral factor called viral infectivity factor. And this is the last topic I'm going to touch upon, but it's actually really then the fact that it lacked VIF didn't make a difference. It made virus, it took that virus, infected the infected permissive site, it kept on making virus. So even though the virus lacked VIF, it was still infectious. That's not surprising, you know, that can be seen. If you took a non-permissive self, cell, infected it with the delta VIF, it made virus, so you could detect virus in the supernatant, but if now you took that virus and tried to infect either permissive cells, which could have been infected here, or non-permissive cells, no virus was being produced. Well, that was a little surprising, because this is not surprising that the non-permissive cell couldn't be infected. I mean, non-permissive means non-permissive. But why all of a sudden could this permissive cell no longer be infected by the virus after one passage through this non-permissive cell? Right? Is that clear? If you took wild-type HIV with VIF, it infected non-permissive cells perfectly well. You took this virus, it could go on and infect over and over again. So something was happening that seemed to be changing the actual function of the virus after it's gone through a non-permissive cell, but that was not happening when it went through a permissive cell. Okay, is that clear? It turned out that when they did a microarray analysis and subtracted hybridization to identify what gene was present in permissive cells and non-permissive cells, they identified a, a gene they called CM, that was called CM15 that was present in the, the non-permissive cells that selectively inhibited HIV replication in the absence of VIF. And if you basically, this is from a patient a paper by Sheehy, if you actually um, took took cells that previously had been permissive, 
So in, in this case, if delta VIF, you would infect them with, with delta VIF, you have very good virus production. If you took these cells and now added CM15, in the absence of, of VIF, they no longer were infectious. So this was clearly showing that this gene CM15 was critical in interacting with VIF in this process of permissive and non-permissive state. By giving it back to a permissive cell, you can make it non-permissive. What was this protein doing? It turned out that this protein was uh, identified as ApoBec3G. And ApoBec3G is a cellular protein, again, what its exact function is, aside from this, is unclear, but what happens is, individual gets the cell gets infected with delta VIF, virus comes in, it makes all the appropriate viral RNAs and structural proteins, but at the same time, somehow, ApoBec3G also finds its way into the virion. Now, does ApoBec ring any bells? ApoBec turns out is, is similar to AID, which is the enzyme that's used to both give somatic mutation and class switching. What is the function of AID? What does AID do to a nucleotide? Anybody remember? It switches, it switches from G to U or something. Right? To cytidine deaminase, a C to a U, and then ultimately that becomes a T, and that generates mutants in the immunoglobulin structure, which is good because there's only those few hotspots. It turns out that ApoBec3G has exactly the same capacity, namely deaminating C to a U and then introducing mutations into the viral genome. However, by introducing enough mutations into the viral genome, what do you think happens to the function of the virus? It changes, and if you have enough mutations, you basically make it no longer viable or infectious. And in fact, that's what ApoBec3G does. So in the virion, as reverse transcriptase, it basically is deaminating it. So now, when this virus infects a new cell, it has all these mutants, and it's a dead virus. So therefore, so, so, so therefore, in, in the absence in the absence of VIF, when you infect a non-permissive cell which has ApoBec3G, it therefore basically causes mutations and it's no longer infectious. The cells that are permissive for delta VIF, what molecule do you think they lack? ApoBec3G. And that's why even though they lack VIF, it doesn't matter because there's no ApoBec3G to get packaged inside of the virus. Now, what does VIF do? It turns out what VIF does is virus infects the cell. VIF is an early RNA gene product, so it's made very quickly. VIF somehow binds to ApoBec3G and sequesters it so it can't get in the virus. So now the virus gets made, it doesn't have ApoBec3G, and now it's fully infectious because no mutations have been introduced. So in essence, normally we've developed this innate way of fighting uh, retroviral infections that actually probably is very effective that we didn't even know about, but that works only until HIV has come up with this modality of using VIF to sequester ApoBec3G, and that's why it's able now to, to replicate very efficiently. Is that clear? Okay, so basically, questions to consider, how does HIV use the efficiency of the immune system to efficiently infect and destroy the immune system? So we talked about multiple ways it does that, both by being carried by dendritic cells to the lymph node, being disseminated all throughout the lymphoid system. Features of replication allow it to evade. Again, the high error rate of reverse transcriptase allows HIV to mutate. So any epitopes, be they antibody epitopes or CTL epitopes, including anchor residues, can be mutated, allowing it to avoid the immune system. How is the re replication synchronized to cellular replication? Again, by utilizing cellular transcription factors to regulate its own replication, and molecular mechanisms used by HIV to evade innate antiviral cellular responses. Again, the VIF APOBAC3G system uh, is used. Again, you know, thank you very much for your attention. <laughs>